because I've never seen money move this fast. This is probably the best prototyping fundraising area for new projects or entrepreneurs to really hit it big. Today's episode is an interview with Frank Chang, co-founder of Eperon. So calling for something truly original, it's something that I really want to do. And it took some time for me to garner and find the right team to do it because trying to innovate and create new games is, is small often not very risky. It takes a lot of time, talent, and resources. And so Aperon is actually that dream that we started. Of course, along the way, it took many prototypes, many trials, many testings, but from a Web2 mobile game all the way to a Web3 game, and now onto the Ronin chain, and finally launching, uh, it's been quite an incredible journey. The growth that we've seen after migrating to Ronin, because Web3 really does open up some new and interesting distribution channels, but how we merge that with traditional mainstream adoption will yeah. just be quite a challenge going forward. The classic trope of nothing then all at once, it yeah. feels like has maybe been the journey so far. Jam packed into quite a chaotic, but in-depth battle that's rather fun. And the core economic loop here is encourage people to battle and then win in order to earn tokens. And using those tokens, we want to inherit and evolve the Axis token breeding system, which mm. is our, where our main economy loop is. We think breeding and NFTs using tokens to breed is actually very powerful as exhibited by Axie. And we want to evolve upon it to improve upon the supply and demand and the, the mechanics behind it. It's quite a giant system and ecosystem yeah. that we've created. Sure. Now on that topic, was it designed from the beginning with Web3 components in mind, or was that an evolution that occurred at some point in game development? So we were always exploring if we can do our own publishing, at least in certain markets. And then my co-founder have always been in the forefront of technology. He's the first one to told us to look into blockchain in 2017. We sort of ignored him, thinking it's too early. And then they really pushed again in 2020, telling us to look, well, there's this game called Axie. It's very interesting, the economy, the ecosystem and when we looked into it, we played it. We found blockchain, the NFT ownership, the tokenized incentives is actually very powerful within. And it would be very interesting if we move over there. And that's how we really studied Axie and we found it to be incredible. And so we tried to incorporate blockchain elements into our game, which took us half a year. And then we began fundraising. And that just like kickstarted on drugs. I've never seen money move this fast before. And, and the teams and everything just got together. The community started growing. Can we talk a little bit about what those top line numbers are? To be honest, I think there are two metrics that we should study as we look at blockchain game DAU. One of the main things that we did for the daily active users is the daily check-in system that we have on the marketplace. Right. So the daily check-in system is quite unique. It's quite essential in order to check on how many actually daily active users they are checking in upon your, our ecosystem. So that number is around 66K and up to 80K now and growing. But of course, as with everything blockchain, we must face that there are bots or multi-accounts trying to grind. Mm. Are there really that many gamers out there? I hope so. But the more important DAU that I would identify would be the actual in-game users who play daily. I highly doubt there are any number beyond 50,000 right now, to be honest, uh, in the Web3 population. When we think about like Web3 gaming as a space, there's very different profiles. Like there's people playing games, but it's still kind of a minority cross-section of those that are enthusiastic about Web3 and crypto, but also actively gaming yeah. every day, like for fun in these games. There are a lot of folks that are interested in Web3 gaming from a speculative standpoint, but they have very different behavior, as you said just very different definitions of even DAU. Like we think of DAU as a gamer, like having a gameplay session, mm. whereas like for these ecosystems that are often funding the games, they're like, no, no, DAU is someone who did daily wallet transaction. But these are like not very one-to-one. -one. Yeah, it's, it's been very interesting working at this nexus of Web3 and gaming and just seeing like very different views of even just the same metrics to find. But yes, it is actually quite a different user segment which is also interesting because it's a new user segment. A lot of them are, are old-time gamers or, or people who have more spending power but less free time on their hands but still are interested right. in it. I think that's one of the reasons why GameFi or blockchain games get so much funding because all the investors, 
the people who play games. And so there's a certain passion and emotion attachment to games. And that's why I think games get so much funding. And of course, well, games provided that have quality and utility can really showcase blockchain technology in the right way, not the speculative way. Is that an intentional strategy where you expect to expand to Web2 users and then bring them into the Web3 side? Or is it just you have a smooth onboarding to get a Web3 user? Or how do you think about the tension between those two audiences? Distribution is still very important. And the king right now is still Google Play, iOS, Steam. These are the platforms that hold the majority of the mainstream markets. And we should work on the gameplay experiences that will help onboard these Web2 users. But more importantly, adhere to the standards, even compliance standards that these platforms have, which is why Web3 games are navigating rather unsteady water. But I think this is essential for games like Aperon, that's more mid-core and targeted towards mainstream. That's what we really want to do. But ultimately, our core audience must be our gamers, the users who play the game, enjoy the game, and don't necessarily have to spend a lot. That's why there's a scholarship, there's rentals, there's a free-to-play, there's a battle pass mode that allows users to experience Aperon in full, whether they pay or not, or become a web-free user or not. One of the greatest things about Ronin is not just that they have this very active and supportive community. They actually have very experienced and passionate founders who really want to support their portfolio companies and, and partners on the chain to succeed. I think that's the main difference. Right now, it seems like there's almost more L2s in chains than there are quality games. So any mm. tips from your journey and your selection to work with Ronin? For us, we actually always view the chain as sort of like the console which we're developing on. So some people have to develop on PS, on, on Xbox, on, on Nintendo. Selecting a chain is like selecting this console because this chain, usually a good one, have their own community. So we want to find these chains and we view them as these console or even publishing partners in the beginning and not just a tech-based layer that we work on. We chose Polygon in the beginning. And the amount of support I got back then was very, very minimal to none, actually. So we were looking for another chain that can provide more dedicated support. Of course, after meeting the Ronin team, it, it made a lot of difference. They were very picky. That's what I say about them. And I love picky people because I've fundraised a lot. You see investors being picky about valuation, about go-to-market strategies, but they're not very picky about the fundamental of the project, whether the team is strong, whether there's a product, whether the market positioning is right. Ronin does all that, and they dive even further deeper, which is good. I think this is how you identify good projects from scams. This community is battle-tested, experienced. They've been through much of crypto's cycles, and then they survived hacks, they survived everything. And so they are very supportive and everything. But more importantly is the management and the team up in SkyMave is to just show you randomly without you having to ask them. They naturally and organically will help you out. And that's just incredible. That's just everything I want to find in a publisher. Ronin is a very game-dedicated chain, and they do look for quality games or, or games that are at least playable. Picking the right chain will be absolutely important. It cuts a lot of the community and the Twitter social media work. Yeah, it is a very important choice, and you need to make a choice of what's best for your situation, because often what I'll see in the ecosystem is the younger chains might be giving out bigger incentives to build with them, but they also provide less infrastructure or less direct support. Mm -hmm. So if your team is young and most values like the bag of cash or bag of tokens to fund the next stage of game development, then working with a younger chain that has not tapped those funds as much might be advantageous. Whereas if your game is more mature, a choice like Ronin, where there's like a ready-made player base that is accustomed, as you said, to jumping into games that speak a certain language, there can be like very high value in that. So I think that's another thing that I would recommend is just make sure you have multiple conversations. Talk to people that have built on these different ecosystems, hear about the good and the bad experiences. How do you think about preparing for that next stage of growth? And what are the challenges and opportunities that you see in that? Well, to cut straight to the chase, it's getting on to Google Play and iOS. Yeah. The whole purpose of developing a mobile game ultimately is to get on those platforms. And the main challenge would be compliance issues or, or regulatory issues. What do we have to do in the game in order to be listed there? The exploration that we have right now is, of course, defining or diverse or, or separating the Web 2 and Web 3 path. 
I talked to some Web3 game teams and they're like, oh, yeah, we don't want to give up a percentage of our revenue. We don't want to give up 30% of the revenue to Apple and Google. So we're just going to do, you know, mobile web app or something like this. Those guys must, like, must never have talked to centralized exchanges. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> they have to understand yeah. that. I guess that people give up on the way here and there. But. Yeah, exactly. So obviously the games we support, mm. we're not trying to get, you know, a hundred thousand players. We're trying to get 50 million, hundred million players into these mm. games. So we will always advise teams and, you know, we worked actually very closely with the, the Axie team at the time that they were trying to get approved by Apple and Google, mm. fostering some of those meetings, sitting down with Apple and Google to work through some of these early policy things. Because if you're going to be a leading game, there's a lot of these Web3 games that will sneak through. There's a lot of Web3 games on the app and Play Store right now that I think, honestly, Apple and Google don't even know are Web3 games. <laughs> Just kind of sneak through approvals, which is one approach. But we always tell teams we, we work with this, like, Guys, if we're trying to make uh, like a top 10 game here, we cannot sneak in. We need to make sure that we're doing things like above board. And sometimes that means slower and more painful. But it seems like you have that same philosophy of like, you'll do it the hard way and the long way if it means that you can attain like the largest possible audience for the game. Might as well spend a little more to do it right and proper. Well, I want to talk just briefly about the future. You have some really major beats coming up. The $1 million annual purse for your Guild Wars tournaments. It will be quite exciting. The prize pool is giant. At least half of it, 500K, will be in USDC cash. The other 500K will be in NFTs and, and other tokens. Going forward, we'll be targeting more uh, Web2 game expos and events because that's where we hope to target our audiences. Beyond that, it would be the development of the IP and the franchise. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's a really... Well thought out and unique launch strategy. I think it's something that a lot of game teams can learn from understanding how to basically create game beats that that go along with the marketing beats to hit a launch date, which is, I think, a really, really clever integrated strategy. One, three, five years out, how do you see Web3 games evolving in their current place in the ecosystem? Do this become crossover? Is this mainstream? Web3 is something that will be staying and growing because... I've never seen money move this fast. This is probably the best prototyping, fundraising, survival area for new projects or, or entrepreneurs to really try and survive and hit it big. I don't think any other fields will trump this. But in order to hit the mainstream, I think in the next two years, one of the main things happening is compliance. As you can see, a lot of centralized exchange are doing now. And so NFTs and games sooner or later will have to follow suit and cannot be avoided. It's really cool to see what a team does when they have the budget, the talent, and the time to really craft a game with care and try to apply some innovation and take from some of the learnings of old, but apply it with the new. Some of you might be pleasantly surprised to learn more about the Aperon. So thank you so much, Frank, for joining us today. It was really cool to learn more about your journey, yeah, the team's journey, and the, the future. And thank you. I'll definitely talk to you guys. Mm -hmm.